What's up, my friends? Today we're going to be working in Affinity Publisher. I'm going to be using a Swiss style grid to create a digital product. And by the end, we're going to end up with something that looks like this using Affinity Publisher. So the first thing I want to do is create a new document. To do that, I'm going to go up top to the file menu, scroll down and select new. And now our new document panel appears. And if you notice, my presets are set to A5 print. And even though I'm making a digital product, this is going to be fine because the presets are really just a jumping off point, but you can adjust everything right down here. So starting with the layout tab, I'm going to first go ahead and change my units from millimeters to pixels. And then I'm going to change my page width to 5120 and my page height to 2880. And then I'm going to change my DPI to 72, which is pretty standard for screens. All right, moving along to the pages tab, I'm going to uncheck facing pages and everything else on this tab looks good. So now let's go to the color tab. I see that it's already set to RGB, which is perfect. So I'm going to move along to the margins tab. So for me, it's sometimes hard to know just how much margin I'm going to need until I start working with the layout. But for now, I'm going to set them all to 100 pixels. And in the back of my mind, I know that I can always go back and adjust those if need be. The last tab is for bleed. And I'm going to leave those set to zero because bleed is only relevant if you're going to be printing something. One quick thing I want to point out, see this little star up here next to the A5? That means I've modified the preset. If I didn't make any of these changes, this star wouldn't be here. All right, and the last step is to hit create. And now we're ready to go. So the first thing I want to do is set a background color. To do that, I'm going to go to the studio panel on the left and select the rectangle tool. Now I'm going to draw a rectangle to cover the entire page. Next, I'm going to double click my set fill tool. And what I'm going for is kind of a reddish orange. So I'm actually going to change the CMYK values to 85 magenta and 100 yellow. That looks pretty good to me, so I'm just going to close the color chooser. All right, the next thing I want to do is set up my grid. To do that, I'm going to go up top to the menu, select view, and select guides. So for this layout, I'm going to go with seven columns and three rows. We already defined our margins in the document setup, so now I'm just going to hit close. But now I notice the page is still blank, so I'm going to go up top to the context toolbar and click preview mode. And now you can see the grid. But now that I'm looking at it, I can see that I want to make a couple of adjustments. So I'm going to hop back into the guides and take care of that real quick. The first thing I want to do is give myself an extra row. So I'm going to change it from three to four. And I'm also going to change my gutter to 50 pixels. All right, now that we have the grid set up, it's time to start placing some text. For this particular project, I'm only going to be using typographic elements, but I'm going to be arranging it in a very graphic and hopefully interesting way. So to get started, I'm going to make sure that my frame text tool is selected, and then I'm going to draw a text frame. All right, now I'm going to copy and paste my first bit of text into the text frame. As you can see, the text is tiny, and that's because the default font size is set to 12 point. So I'm just going to go ahead and change that so we can see it better. So now we're at 300 point, and that's an improvement, but I'm going to go ahead and increase it just a bit more. The next thing I want to do is style my text. So I'm going to go up top to the context toolbar, and I already know that I want to use Helvetica Noi, so I'm just going to go ahead and type that in. And now I'm going to change it from regular to bold. And the last thing I'll do is change the font color from black to white. Now that I've styled the text, I want to adjust the text frame because this headline is looking a little cramped. So I'm going to head over to the studio panel and select the move tool. And then I'm going to adjust this text frame so that it covers five columns. And while I'm at it, I'm going to reposition the text frame so that it fits neatly inside of the modules. So now I'm going to place the body copy and this time around, I'm going to go a little bit faster. So first I'm going to make sure that my frame text tool is selected. I'm going to draw a text frame. I'm going to click the move tool and now I'll move that text frame into position. Next I'll copy and paste my body copy into the text frame. As you can see, the body copy is already somewhat styled. 
We're using the same typeface, Helvetica Noi, only this time the weight is medium and it's set to 75 point. I may go back and modify that further, but let's move on for now. The next thing I want to do is add some subheads. I've already placed a text frame in the upper left module, and now I'm just duplicating it by holding down the Option key while dragging the text frame, because ultimately I want three subheads to fit across the top of the page. So now I'll just manually type in the subheads. And while I do that, let's talk about the Swiss grid. You're probably more familiar with it than you think, and that's because these days it's ubiquitous. Think of it as a structured framework for organizing content. It focuses on clarity, simplicity, and functionality. It almost takes a mathematical approach to design, which you can see in this layout here. All the content fits squarely inside the pre-existing rows and columns. This creates a sense of order, legibility, and hierarchy, which is why the Swiss grid is used often in books, magazines, and other editorial content. All right, let's go back to the layout. Right now I'm opening the text frame tool to finish styling my subheads. And down at the bottom you'll see options for aligning your content to the top, left, right, or bottom. In this case I'm choosing top because I want the subheads to touch that top margin. Alright, so I want to go back to my body copy real quick and add a couple of forced line breaks so that we can make that rag on the right a little bit more even. And I'm doing that by placing my cursor where I want the line break and holding down the shift key while I hit return. The next thing I want to do is create a very large typographic element that creates a little bit of asymmetry and abstraction. So as you can see I've zoomed out quite a bit. I'm selecting the frame text tool and now I'm just drawing a large text frame. And now I'll type in an uppercase O in 5000 point type. Now I'm going to select the move tool, click on the text frame, and drag it down towards the bottom of the page. Alright, that looks good enough for now. So now I'll just repeat the process on the other side. The whole idea with these letters was to create some kind of a visual reminder or representation of the content above. Now on their own, the letters O and J don't have any special meaning, but at this large size, if we position them a certain way, I thought it could almost look like a path that goes off of the page and comes back on again. Anyway, that was the idea. Let's take a look and see where we're at. Alright, moving along. So I had this idea to take elements of the grid and integrate it into the design. So I've hopped into the photo persona, I've selected the pin tool, and now I'm just outlining the margin with a five point stroke. And now that I'm done with that, I'm going to hop back into the publisher persona and take a look. Alright, I think that looks pretty good, but before I go back to the photo persona and add in more lines, I see an alignment issue that I'd like to fix. So what I've done is I've opened up the text frame tool again, and starting off with the first subhead, I'm adding a little bit of inset space to the top and left side of the text frame. And now I'm just giving the same amount of space to the other subheads. Now this may seem like a small detail, but if I hadn't have done this, the words would have been touching the white outline of the margin ever so slightly. But by giving them a little bit of space, not only does it look better, but it makes the subheads more readable. Alright, now I'm going to turn the guides back on. I'm going to hop back into the photo persona, and I'm going to add a couple more strokes. So I made the decision to only apply strokes to the rows, not the columns. So that makes my job a lot easier, because I only have to add three horizontal lines. And to do that, once again I've selected the pin tool, I've made sure that my stroke is set to five point, and now I'm just tracing the horizontal guides that make up my rows. And if you notice, I'm placing the stroke right in the middle of the gutter because that's what's going to make the spacing between the lines more even. Alright, so I just have one more line to add. And after that, I'll hop back into the publisher persona and wrap things up. I'm really loving this pin tool by the way. I'm curious what you guys think of the personas. Do you actually use them on a regular basis? Let me know down in the comments. Alright, so hopping back into the publisher persona, I'm going to turn on preview mode and take a look. I mean, we're pretty much done at this point, but because I placed my stroke in the gutter, I'm just going to nudge my headline and body copy so that they each fit flush against the white lines. All right, you guys, that's pretty much it. I hope you got some value out of this. Thanks for sticking around. I'll see you in the next one.